How are y'all doing? Yeah, it's a pretty good little intro, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of tough to stand up to that and preach after that. I feel kind of a little pressure. I've always kind of felt pressure in preaching. Uh, about 14 years ago, when I preached my first sermon, when I'd just gone into ministry, uh, they let me preach the Good Friday service. And there's some reasons for that. One, Good Friday is going to have a much smaller crowd than a Sunday morning service. But also, it's your most committed church members that are going to show up for that. So they're not going to leave if they have one bad experience with preaching. So that's my first sermon, and I was really nervous about it. And I didn't sleep much the night before, and I worried about it all day. And so when I got up to start preaching... I was still nervous, and so my voice was quaking and cracking. That got better after a couple of minutes, but what didn't get better is I get dry mouth when I get a little nervous. I still get that today. If you'll see me walking around with lozenges, lozenges that's the last vestige of that that holds on. But so my, my voice was dry, and so it just didn't sound right. But that wasn't the worst part. The worst part is that I'd made the decision to bring my big study Bible to use to read Scripture. And I set it up on this little stand like this one, It was way too heavy for the stand, so the stand constantly went down, and I had to constantly pull it back up all through the sermon. And if that wasn't bad enough, the wind was blowing because it was outside, and it was blowing my notes. And so to keep my notes from blowing away, because I'd use paper notes back then, I had to put the Bible kind of on top of it on one side and my hand on top of it so I couldn't talk really, and it's going down, and I'm trying to pull it back up. You can imagine... And then to add insult to injury, the wind was also blowing my microphone, so it made this weird sound through the whole sermon. My sermon, it could have gone worse, but let's be honest, it could have gone a lot better too. And so for the next few days, I really began to question whether I was enough to preach. I started to wonder, maybe I'd gone into ministry way too late to preach a sermon that wasn't painful for me and painful for everybody else that had to sit through it. And that isn't the last time that's happened. About my sixth or seventh time preaching from the stage on a Sunday morning, I preached. I felt pretty good about it. I go out into the lobby, and I'm greeting people with my wife, and a guy comes up and gives me what I think he thought was a compliment or encouragement, but, but here's what he said. He said, do you know how the lead pastor is so conversational when he preaches? It's like you're just chatting about a, a Bible topic. And I said, yeah. Well, you're not like that at all. I'm like, huh. He said, it's more like you're giving us a PowerPoint presentation. You're like preaching at us like we're in some business meeting. But today, I think you may have turned a corner. It was a little better. And I just wanted to tell you that maybe you're getting better. My wife was so irritated at this point that she just walked away. If she'd have stayed, she would have said something pretty unchristian to this dude. So she just walked away from the conversation. And I stood there and I politely listened to his encouragement. But on the inside, I'm hearing... I'm not enough. I was hearing the lie, you're not enough. And you know, that still even continues with me today. On rare occasion, I'll see someone lean over to their spouse and say something during my message. And I'm sure they're talking about, you know, a passage of scripture or something they've heard before. But sometimes what I hear is, he's preaching at us like a PowerPoint presentation. And I still have that vestige where my throat still gets a little dry when I preach. And so I'm constantly dealing with that. And look, it's not just in preaching where I can question whether I'm enough. Big place I do that is counseling here at the church on tough situations. I never feel like I'm enough. As a parent, I can feel that I'm not enough. As in my marriage, I've felt that in the past. In so many different situations in my jobs, I feel like you're not enough. And so this is the lie that we're gonna tackle today. Here it is. The lie is you're not enough. Now, I know I'm not the only one that's felt this. You guys have felt it too, whether you're going to admit it or not, because you don't want to admit your weakness, right? So you felt it. I don't know what areas you felt it, but you have. It happens. Now, what's weird about this lie is it actually motivates me in a lot of ways. I've actually had success because I buy into that lie. It has caused me to work really hard, and I've had success as as an attorney and as a pastor. But I can't get past that nagging feeling that you're not enough. I have this saying that I use pretty regularly that says, I don't care that much about winning, but man, I hate to lose. That drives me. There's truth to that. And maybe you're where I am and you've had a lot of success because you're driven by always feeling inadequate, but you just can't get past the lie. You can't get past that nagging in the back of your mind so it robs you of your peace and your joy. Or or maybe some of you have gone the complete opposite direction and you just don't try in a lot of areas because (laughs) even if you try, 
You feel like you're gonna mess it up at some point. You're not enough. And so you just don't try very hard. And so you kind of coast through your marriage, your family, growing in holiness with God or your occupation. Because here's the thing, if you don't try very hard and it doesn't go well, you're not disappointed because you didn't really fail. You didn't give it any effort. But that causes you to miss out on so many of the things that God intends for your life. This may mean that you never get really close in relationships with other people because you know at some point (laughs) you're going to mess it up and you're going to get hurt just like you have in the past. And so it keeps you from really taking chances and getting out of your comfort zone because you believe it wouldn't go well anyway. And if you don't try, then you don't have to feel as bad when it doesn't go well. If you're really honest with yourself, it may be the reason you're struggling to decide whether to be in a community group or not because you just kind of know if you step out of your comfort zone, it's not going to go as well as you would like. But this lie keeps you from living the full life that Jesus intends for you. It keeps you from the joy that he intended. It keeps you from having the relationship with him and other people that you're called to have. Let me just throw out a few words and and see how these words hit you. What comes to your mind? Uninvited. Rejected. Unwanted. Abandoned. Fired. Divorced, failure, excluded, neglected, overlooked, replaced, forgotten. You hear those words and what really comes to your mind is this lie, you're not enough. And here's why this lie is so effective. The most powerful and effective lies aren't things that are completely untrue. They are things that have a whole lot of truth in them and just enough lies so that, man, you bite it hook, line, and sinker. See, no, hook, line, and sinker. And that's how this lie works because it is actually true as said. It's just not the whole truth. And so we buy into that lie. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to look at chapters 11 and 12. This is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church in the ancient city of Corinth. At the time Paul writes this letter, Corinth was a very powerful and large city. It had about 600,000 people that lived there, which for that time was a massive city. It was a cultured city that was known for its architecture. It was a commercial and political center of the Roman Empire in that region. These people were wealthy and well-connected politically. And because of that, they were very enamored with strength. They were very enamored, enamored with accomplishments and education Paul first traveled to Corinth in his second missionary journey, and he started a church there. And then over the next several years, he writes at least four letters to this church. And two of those letters are in our New Testament called 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And we have that today. But the problem is that after Paul goes and starts this church and he writes his first letter, some false teachers go into Corinth and they begin to spread a false gospel. And the way these guys did it is they, they sang what they'd accomplished. They talked about their education. They talked about their training. They talked about how they had suffered. And so people were like, wow, that guy's really strong. I like what he has to say. And so some people were starting to buy into that false teaching. And and so Paul's in a bit of a predicament here in 2 Corinthians because he's got to combat this strength of all of these people that have come in and taught falsely, but he also doesn't want to talk about his own strengths because he wants a church to get away from their own strength and begin to rely on the strength and power of God. He wants them to delight in their weakness so that they can experience God's strengths. And look, (laughs) this is a challenge for us as well. We live in a culture that celebrates and loves strength, right? We've got American Ninja Warrior kind of shows all over TV. We celebrate muscles and bodybuilding and athleticism. But it's not just physically, we celebrate accomplishments, we celebrate success, we celebrate being self-sufficient and self-made. We show off our strength of our families on social media, kid winning this, our kid doing that, our kid accomplishing that, our husband or wife doing that. We celebrate strength. And so for so many of us, weakness isn't something to be celebrated. It's something to be hidden and overcome. You know, between my job as a pastor and being the managing shareholder of a law firm, I've interviewed a lot of people for jobs over the years. And I have some stock questions that I pretty much always ask. One of those is, what are your professional and personal strengths? 
and they'll tell me about how they're a team player, they're hardworking, they're very organized and all that. But then I'll follow it up with the second question, what's a weakness that you struggle with? And and so often what will happen is they'll take a strength and they'll kind of turn it into a weakness. Like here's one of my favorites. You know, I, I sometimes work so hard that I get my personal life out of balance. What they're really telling me is the employers, look, if you hire me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bust it here, and that's going to affect my family, but it's going to be awesome here. Or they'll say things like, you know, I work so hard to get everything perfect that sometimes it can take a little longer than I want it to. What they've done is they've taken a strength and they've manipulated it to sound like a weakness. And they do that because they're scared to tell me a real weakness. They, they don't want me to, they're afraid that if they tell me a weakness, I won't hire them. But one of the reasons I ask this question is I want to know, are they honest and are they self-aware? Obviously, we all have things we can do better than other things. And I actually want to hear a real weakness. Now, there's some limits to that, right? If their weakness is that they stay up partying most every Sunday night so much that they never show up on Monday morning, keep that one on the down low. Don't tell me that one. But I want to hear something that you're working on to get better. But we hide our weaknesses because we buy into this lie that our weaknesses are worse than everybody else's. And nobody is going to love us or accept us if we talk about our weaknesses. And look, we don't just do that in job interviews. We do that in our lives. We cover up and disguise and hide our weaknesses so nobody knows how they can help us. Nobody knows the encouragement we need because they don't understand. We, we don't get out of our comfort zone and take risks because man, we just know it's going to not go well anyway. But Paul, in this passage that we're looking at today, he's going to flip this idea upside down on us. He's going to say that God's very best work isn't in our strength. His very best work is in our weakness. Here's the truth that tears down the lie. You are not enough, but God is more than enough. That's what makes that true. You can see the lie right there. You are not enough. And if you put a period there, you stuck with a lie. But that's not the whole truth. God is enough. He's more than enough. So Paul's going to do something interesting and pretty unusual for him. He's going to start out by talking about all his strengths, something Paul rarely does. But he knows that they're enamored with strength. And so if he's tar- talking about how weak he is, they're going to say, oh, you, don't, you haven't done what those other teachers have done. We're going to believe them. So he's going to do something very unusual. But then he lays out all of his strengths. And then at the end, he wads those up and he tosses them in the trash can and says, forget about all that. It doesn't matter. So let's dive in and look at what Paul does. This is 2 Corinthians. We're going to start verse 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 21. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, now he says, I'm speaking as a fool. In other words, why, why in the world am I boasting? I also dare to boast about. He's saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to talk about some streets. You're going to like to hear it, but it's crazy. I shouldn't be doing it. Let's keep going. This is 2 Corinthians 11, 22 through 27. He says, he's comparing himself to the false teachers here. He says, are they Hebrews? Well, so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? And he says, look, I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. Been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. That's a little humbling for me. He, he's, he's had some serious suffering for the gospel. Look, I made some sacrifices along the way to, for my preaching, but I can't stick with Paul. And so Paul is saying here, look, it's crazy that I'm doing this. But whatever those dudes have told you they've suffered, it can't stick with what I've done. I have strength. If you want to talk about strength, let's talk about strength. And then he's going to up the ante when he goes on to 2 Corinthians 12.1, and he's going to continue to boast. He says, look, I must go on boasting, although there's nothing to be gained. I'll go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven, Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. 
And I know that this man, whether in body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one else is permitted to talk about. But I will boast about a man like that. And he's talking about himself here. But I'm not going to boast about myself because I will only boast about my weakness. But look, even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I'd be speaking the truth. But I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or I say. So here's what Paul is saying. 14 years ago, I was taken up to heaven. And not just the first heaven, not just the second heaven, but the third heaven. We don't even know what that is. A lot of scholars think that, that he, Paul actually got to sit down, hang out with God, have a conversation with him and see some things. But we don't really know because we've not been there. But what's amazing is this is 14 years ago. Paul's never mentioned it in any of his other teachings or in the acts in his preaching. We don't see this. He doesn't talk about it. He says, I saw some pretty amazing things. But look, I'm, I'm not going to tell you about that because we're just not going to talk about that. Look, <laughs> I'm going to be really honest and transparent with you guys for a second. If I get to go up to heaven and have a vision, I'm going to talk about it. I am going to, like, I'm going to blow up Instagram and social media. There's going to be pictures of me like playing paddle ball with Moses and beating somebody in gin rummy, me and David, and I'm just throwing down the cards on him. You're going to see all of that. You may see me, a picture of me flipping through the big book of life. I may scratch out a name or two while I'm up there. <laughs> then when I get back, I'm going to work it into every sermon. You'd be so sick of hearing about heaven, you would quit coming to the church because that dude's talking about heaven again. I might write a book that says, entitled, Heaven. I've been there, and you haven't. I'd probably introduce myself at church that way. I wouldn't say I'm the pastor here at Kara City. I'd say, you know, I'm the pastor that's been to the third heaven. You can meet our other pastors, but I probably wouldn't wait, waste my time. They haven't even been to the first heaven. But not Paul. He's never bragged about this. He's never really talked about it. He only mentions it here to make a point, and he doesn't give any details. Instead, how does Paul usually introduce himself in his letters? What does he say? Paul, a slave or a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And if you know anything about slaves at that time, it didn't matter what your education was. It didn't matter what your training was or your experience was. The only thing that mattered was who your, who your boss was, who your master was. And so Paul wanted people to know who he followed and who he served. So here's the one point of my sermon. This is the key takeaway that I want you to see today. There's the truth. You are not enough, but God is more than enough. And the takeaway from this sermon is don't rely on your own strength. See, when we rely on our own strength, we're taking away God's ability to work in his best situation through your weakness. And, and Paul actually talks about this in his own life. I want us to look back at the very beginning of this, this letter. This is chapter one where Paul is kind of updating the church on his missionary trip into the continent of Asia. But he's also preparing them for this teaching about living out in our weakness and relying on God's strength. Let's look, look at what he says. I want to use the message paraphrase here. It's a paraphrase, not an actual translation, but it just puts this in very modern language to hear. Paul says to the church, we don't want you in the dark, friends, about how hard it was when it all came down on us in the Asia province. It was so bad, we didn't think we were going to make it. We felt like we'd been sent to death row, that it was all over for us. As it turned out, it was the best thing that could have happened. Instead of trusting in our own strength or wits to get out of it, we were forced to trust God totally. And he says, you know, that's not a bad idea because he's the God who has the power to raise people from the dead. We don't know exactly what Paul went through in Asia. He didn't really ever talk about that. But what we do know is that it tested him beyond his own ability. It challenged him beyond his own strength. It, he suffered beyond his own ability to handle it. And he had to completely rely on God's strength. But he says, that's the best thing that could ever happen to me because I had to get out of the way. I had to let God take over and rely on his strength. And oh, by the way, that's not a bad thing because God has the power to bring back people from the dead. You know, almost every morning when I get up, I pray that God would give me his strength and his wisdom for the day. I pray that before I go to work at the church. I pray that before I go to work at the law firm because I want his wisdom and his strength. If I've got a difficult conversation that I'm about to go in or a difficult meeting, I'll pray that God will give me the words that he would have me say, that he would give me his wisdom for handling that. I ask for his wisdom as a parent, as a friend, as a husband. I pray that almost every day to prepare myself to rely on God's strength. 
And here's the cool thing that I get to see when I do that. So often I'll be in a meeting and it'll go better than I thought it was or a situation will go better than I expected or I'll feel God giving me his words and his wisdom and his strength. When I acknowledge my need for God, he shows up and I get to see him work. Lil and I homeschooled all of our kids, and we were a part of this association called the Christian Homeschool Association of Katy or whatever, and they put on these dances, you know, like proms and things like that, and I didn't love my three girls going to dances with boys. I didn't. I didn't like that very much, but I did like the rule that they had for slow dancing in this Christian Homeschoolers Association. They said, when you slow dance, leave room for Jesus. I like that. I would have preferred leave room for a big truck or a conference room table, But I like to leave room for Jesus. And that's kind of what Paul is telling us here. He's saying leave room for Jesus. When we act out of our own strength, we're not leaving room for Jesus. But when we acknowledge our weakness and we celebrate that, we leave room for him to show off his, his power, his mercy, and his grace. But how do we do that, right? That's the hard part. It's easy. No, Nathan, you're telling me to do all this stuff. How do we do it? How do we move from relying on our own strength or wallowing in our own weakness and begin to rely on God's strength. The easiest way to get started is prayer. Every morning, get up and pray for God's strength for that day. Pray for God's wisdom for that day. Pray for his wisdom as a parent, as a child, as a friend. Pray for his wisdom in your workplace, as a follower of Jesus, and then watch him work. You also need to be praying that his power would deliver you from temptation, that his strength would help you overcome obstacles. We can also begin to rely on, more, on God's strength by letting go of our worry about things that we can't control. See, when there are things that we can't control and we worry, it's like we're saying, I've got to deal with this. I can't, but I've got to deal with it. And we worry and we stress. But when you give that to God and say, God, I can't handle this. And there's nothing I can do. But you've got this. You're recognizing that it's his strength you need, not your own. You can also follow Paul's example. and You can give God credit for things that go well. When things happen well in your life or you have success, recognize that you're operating out of the gifts that he gave you, the strength that he gave you, the power that he has. We also need to be honest with ourselves and the people that are close to us about our struggles and failures and sin. And and here's something really cool that happens when we really begin to get out of the way and we begin to rely on God's strength. People see Jesus, not us. I I love this passage from Acts 4.13 uh, where you see this, it's, uh, they'd been, Peter and John had been doing these crazy things, they'd been teaching and preaching, and it says in verse 13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Here's what happened. The people that were seeing John and Peter, they knew they weren't the best educated, they weren't the most trained, they weren't really prepared for this moment, and yet, God was doing amazing things through them. They saw Jesus. God's power was revealed. And I think that's why God so often uses the most unexpected people to do great things. We see that throughout the Bible. Because when something happens, it's clear that God is the one who overcame the obstacle. It's God that is the one who wins. And if we want people to follow Jesus, my strength is not going to do it. We need them to see Jesus' strength, not our own. And look, isn't that what we'd really like people to say about us anyway? Like, at my funeral, I hope somebody gets up and says, you know, I can tell by the way that dude lived that he'd been with Jesus. That's what we want people to see. We want people to see Jesus in us. The Bible says that we're supposed to be like a light in a dark world. That people see us because of the way we live, but they don't just see us. They see Jesus in us. And then as a church, the Bible describes us as a city on a hill, a light that cannot be hidden. People see us, hopefully they're drawn and they're introduced to Jesus. I don't know if you've ever driven out in central or west Texas where it's flat and there are no trees and you can see forever. If you drive out there at night, it's such a cool experience because it is pitch black. The only lights are the lights on your car. But as you get close to a city, way off in the distance, you'll see a glowing light. Long before you can see the city, you see the light of that city. And it's such a contrast between the darkness that you're traveling through and what you're seeing ahead. It draws you to it. People are drawn to their, the light. We're, we're supposed to be that city shining in the dark world. All right, let's get back to our passage of Scripture in chapter 12 
because of all the success that Paul's had, and he's had a lot. He's had lots of education and training. He has a lot of his own strength that he could rely on. Because of that, there was a possibility that he could become prideful and conceited. And so Paul is given a weakness by God to remind him of his desperate need for God's strength. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 8. This is Paul talking here. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. So Paul is saying, look, God gave me some thorn in the flesh. Now, what's amazing is Paul never tells us throughout all his writings what that thorn in the flesh is. There's a lot of uh, different scholars that have different ideas. There's a few scholars that think that this was some sort of a sin struggle, but I don't think that's right. It, It talks about it being a thorn in the flesh, which gives us the idea that it's more physical in nature. Some scholars think that it was poor vision or epilepsy or migraines or serious stomach problems or was, he was hard of hearing. Other scholars think it was actually some physical deformity that he was missing something that we all have. I, I really tend to think that this was a serious vision problem based on different things he says in his different letters. There's lots of different theories about what the thorn is, but there's no question that this was a big deal. If you look at the Greek word that Paul actually wrote this in, that's translated into the word thorn, that same word can also be translated into a big wooden stake. That's the word that Paul uses here. Remember, Paul's a tough dude. That dude's been beaten over and over. He's been stoned, he's been bitten by snakes, he's been shipwrecked three different times. He is a tough dude. For this to have impacted him, it had to be a big deal. Paul says three different times he begged God to take this away. Now, I I think he asked God to take it away way more than that. But I think what Paul is saying is three different times he got down on his knees and I bet tears running down his face. And he said, God, please, please take this thorn away. But even though this thorn was a really big deal and even though it impacted Paul's ministry in his life, he didn't dwell on it. This is the only place in all the Bible that he talks about it. And he doesn't even tell us what it is. He didn't, he didn't want us to know what he's struggling with. He just devotes a couple of sentences to that. Well, why is that? Probably for the same reason that he didn't tell us about his trip to heaven 14 years before. It's not about Paul. It's about Jesus. It's not about Paul's strength, but it's also not about Paul's weakness. It's about God. That's where the focus should be. So let me ask you a question. What's your thorn? What's your thorn in the flesh? Maybe it's a physical thing, like Paul, and it's a health struggle or something that holds you back physically. Or or maybe it's a struggle in your family or with your church or in your life or in your job. Well, what's that thorn that God hasn't taken away? Maybe you've gotten a little frustrated with God that he hadn't taken it away yet. Maybe you've gotten a lot frustrated with God and it started to impact your faith or you're starting to question God's goodness. And and what happens is we begin to focus so much on that thorn that holds us back. We can't move past it, and we can't make the situation or the circumstances better. Paul calls this suffering, he says it's a messenger of Satan. Here's what he's saying here. Paul recognizes that this thorn is from Satan, but he also recognizes that God can take it away, that God has the power to take it away. And and I think that's probably a, a pretty effective way for us to think about our own suffering. God didn't cause the suffering, but God does have the power to take it away. So the question is, when he doesn't, why doesn't he? Paul gives us the answer, and this is directly from God. This is not a sermon about suffering, but this passage speaks to that. Look, this is an answer to Paul from God, verses 9 through 10. But he said to me, saying, God said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. There's the truth right there. For when I am weak, I am strong. And if you can get away from the lie and embrace this truth, your perspective on so many things is going to change. We aren't enough, but God is. We can't change certain things, but God can. We can't overcome difficulty, struggles, hardship, temptation, but God can. The Bible says we are more than conquerors through the power of Jesus. 
And so Paul says, look, if God's power is revealed in my weakness, then man, I'm going to revel in my weakness. I'm going to celebrate my weakness because that's where God shows up. And that's such a powerful lesson for us. God's grace and his power is sufficient for everything we go through. Look, and that's why church should be a place where we admit that we are weak and we celebrate that he is strong. We, we celebrate who he is. We can't do it, but he can. We're not enough, but he is more than enough. That's the truth that overcomes the lie. We are made perfect in our weakness. See, it, it's in this awareness of this truth where we begin to really intersect with God's power and see it show up. We have to come in broken for Jesus to fix us. Like if we come to church and act like we don't have any struggles, that we don't have anything going on, nobody's gonna know how to pour into us. Nobody's gonna know how to encourage and pray for us. We gotta acknowledge our weakness, our struggles to get better. I, I love Jesus at some point was questioned by the Pharisees by why he was always hanging out with sinners. And I love his response. He says this in Luke 5, 31 through 32. He says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's saying, look, I didn't call to come to, to offer uh, repentance for the people that claim they've got it all together. That's the Pharisees that act like they're strong in themselves. I came to save the people who recognize their desperate need for me, my grace, my strength. And in that desperation for healing, Jesus shows up. We're all broken. We need to be honest about that so we can be restored and made new by the Jesus who takes broken things and repairs them, who takes ugly, messy things and makes them beautiful again. But it all starts with us acknowledging that without Jesus, we aren't enough. Look, it, if I go to the doctor and I'm going for my knee and it's hurting me, and I get there and the doctor says, so what's, what's bothering you today? I said, nothing, doc. Man, I just came to check on you. How are you doing? Is he going to look at my knee? Of course not. He doesn't know that that's what he needs to do. I'm not acknowledging the problem I have, so he can't fix me. To get help, we have to admit the problem. See, we want to be a church that partners with you to help you in your struggles, in your failure, in your sin. Jesus called his church to love and accept people right where they are, to meet them right where they're at. That's not the end of the story. He also calls us to challenge and encourage them to grow. Church should be a place where it's okay to not be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. Back in ancient Rome, the, the pottery that they made was pretty thin and fragile. And sometimes during the, the curing process, that pottery would, would crack or it might even break. A little piece would chip off of it. And some unscrupulous dealers, they would take wax and they would fill in the crack with wax or they would stick that little piece on and kind of glue it back together with wax. Then they'd paint over it and they'd sell it to people as being perfectly good without flaw or defect. And which was fine until the people got the, the pottery home and it sat out in the sun and got hot and that wax would start to melt and it would reveal the defects in that pottery. And so because of that, some honest uh, dealers in the city of Rome began to stamp the bottom of the vases and the things they made with the, the Latin word, Sinacera. And what Sinacera means, means literally without wax. But Sinacera also became the English word sincere. You hear that? Sinacera, sincere. And this Latin phrase turns into an English word, sincere, that means to be real, to be who we really are. See, so often we try to cover up our flaws and our failures. We, we have cracks and we're broken but we try to pass ourselves as being off with being without defects. We come into church with this fake smile, this everything's awesome response to how are you doing? But the reality is when the heat gets turned up and our flaws are gonna show up, it's gonna melt like wax, that exterior is gonna go away, it leaves us broken and hurting. But, but if we work to be sincere, we can find healing through Jesus Christ. We can find healing through his church. We need to be real so that we can experience real healing. We can experience God's real power and then we can make a real difference in the world around us. We aren't perfect. Every one of us struggles with weaknesses. 
When, when someone follows Jesus, it doesn't magically make all their problems and their sins and their temptations go away. They'll have to work with the power of Jesus to get rid of their anger and lust and selfishness and pride. The church, if you want to accuse us of being imperfect, <laughs> that's not a lie. We are imperfect because we are made up of imperfect people. But here's what you need to understand. We worship a God who is perfect, who has power beyond our ability to imagine it, who will never fail us ever. That's who we worship. It's not about who we are as a church. It's about who we follow. Here's what I'm learning. The extent to which we experience God's strength is in direct proportion to the extent to which we recognize our own weakness. Let me say that again because that's so important. The extent to which we experience God's strength is in direct proportion to the extent which we recognize our own weakness. And if that's true, shouldn't we step into our weaknesses? Shouldn't we celebrate our weaknesses so that God can step in and use us? Shouldn't we be a people who actually delight when we don't really know what to do, where we don't know where to turn, where we don't know what our next step is, where we feel inadequate, when we feel afraid? If those are the moments when we really intersect with God's power, shouldn't that be something we look forward to, not run away from and hide? Shouldn't we take risks to get out of our comfort zone? The truth is, we are not enough. You are not enough. I am not enough. But God is more than enough. That's the takeaway. Let's pray.